Are you being had by the motorcycle industry, slowly being trained to salivate at ever bigger and more expensive bikes like some Dainese wearing Pavlov's dog? If you live in a well-to-do country, you are a victim of manipulation by the motorcycle industry and you may not even be noticing it. How? Stay tuned. I was born behind the Iron Curtain and lived the first nine years of my life in Poland until my family moved to Canada in 1984. Living there was like being in a bit of a time warp. A lot of things were what you might describe as old school. When I used to visit my grandparents who lived on a farm, I drew water out of a well with a bucket if I wanted a drink. If I needed to use the bathroom, I went to the outhouse, even in the winter in minus 30 Celsius. That's minus 22 Fahrenheit for my US viewers. Their house didn't have running water in the early 80s. Sounds hard, but there's a certain nobility to living a Spartan life. Hardship makes you appreciate the little luxuries. No water ever tasted better than the water from that well, and there's nothing like spending some time in an outhouse in minus 30 Celsius to make you appreciate the coziness of a wood-burning stove. Poland didn't have a large motorcycle industry, but there was one big motorcycle that was produced there called the Junak. This was a bike that some people still call the Polish Harley. It was ridden by the police and by the well-to-do, and was considered to be a big, imposing motorcycle. The engine? A 350cc single cylinder. The horsepower? 19. Two-thirds of what my wife's 300cc Honda puts out today. And therein lies my point. Have we in the West become out of touch with what is a big motorcycle? Have we lost our way? In most of the world, a Sportster is an enormous bike. In North America, it's the little one that noobs learn to ride on. Ride one through the streets of India, streets full of 150cc motorcycles and 50cc scooters, and see the wonder in people's eyes as you pass. Then come back home and call it a small bike. This is the Harley F-Head, which was introduced in 1914. It was a monster of a motor for the time as it came in at 1200 cc. In 1937, a 1300 plus cc displacement was added to the flathead engine lineup. Those two displacements were Harley's go-to engine sizes for 85 years until 1999 when the twin cam motor was introduced. That engine went from 1450 cc to 1580 and then to 1690. The Milwaukee 8 continued this trend and is now up to 1920cc in a couple of the CVO models. So after having the same engine sizes for most of a century, all of a sudden Harley went and got itself in a hurry to get bigger and bigger because the metric bikes kept upping the ante. Or maybe because its baggers had to keep up with Honda's Goldwing or BMW's K-bikes. Speaking of BMW, they just recently released their R18, which was supposed to be a homage to the R5. The R5 was a 500cc bike that weighed under 400 pounds full of fuel. The R18 is more than three times that displacement and almost twice the weight and has a reverse gear in case you want to back up and you don't happen to be a power lifter. The R18 is not the modern R5, it's a locomotive wearing an R5 Halloween costume. BMW is also guilty of continuing to make its other bikes larger and heavier, especially the GS line. The 800cc legendary R80GS weighed 409 pounds wet in 1981. By 2004, the R1200GS weighed around 500 pounds, while the current R1250GS adds more than 50 pounds to that number and the adventure model weighs almost 600 pounds. This has been happening everywhere. As time passes, products tend to get bigger and more expensive. I'm old enough to remember when Honda Accords looked like this instead of this. So what are the reasons for this growth? Some of the changes are absolutely necessary. One is competition. Brand A increases engine size and puts out some bells and whistles and brand B has to do the same and one-up them with another bell or whistle. And before you know it, you have to pull your 600 pound $30,000 adventure motorcycle over to the side of the road and fiddle with menus and rider modes for five minutes before you can take on that three mile stretch of gravel road in front of you. Another reason for increases in size and complexity is legislation. More stringent emission standards require heavier emissions equipment. Or you go to liquid cooling like the GS and put on a radiator and coolant which adds weight. Another thing that has changed has been the weight of the average rider. I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but the average weight of both an American man and woman has risen by more than 20 pounds in the last 40 years. The average rider also carries more gear because we've become more safety conscious. Today's bikes have to carry more weight as a result. And they have to keep up with faster traffic because speed limits have risen. 
In the past, a motorcycle that was capable of comfortably chugging along at 60 miles per hour or 100 kilometers per hour in a relaxed manner was fine. Today's touring bikes have to be able to zip along at 80 miles per hour or 130 kilometers per hour while remaining fuel efficient and not over revving. Ergo, bigger motors. But let's be real. Mostly the reason for this insane race for more size and power is profit. The more features you shoehorn into a bike, the more you can charge for it, and the more you make on it. Lean sensitive ABS and traction control, cornering lights, blindside detection, lane departure detection, TFT touchscreen, GPS, sound system, automatic trans, cruise control, heated grips and seat, electric windshield, electronically adjustable suspension, and before you know it the bike drives you to your destination while you nap in a massage chair on the back. I'm beginning to suspect that we are losing the spirit of motorcycling here. I don't recall Peter and Dennis electronically adjusting the suspensions on their hardtail choppers during their ride across the country. They didn't have suspensions. They had compressed spines at the end of the ride. That's what hardtail means. And that's part of the spirit of motorcycling. Being less comfortable than you would be in a car. Braving the elements is part of the fun, like squeezing one out in an outhouse in minus 30. It's not really fun, but you can be proud you did it and it makes for a good story later. But not if your bike doesn't let any elements at you when you ride. At what point does a Goldwing just become a Civic? And believe me, I'm not criticizing. I totally fell for it too. I went into a BMW dealer to buy an F800 GS and left with a Moto Guzzi Stelvio 1200 NTX. They were both used, were the same price and I figured why get an 800 when I can get a 1200 for the same money. And it was great. That bike is super comfortable and you feel like a king cruising the road on it. The elements? What elements? There's a barn wall in front of me when I ride. And when I first took it out with my wife on the back, I joked that it felt like a bagger, it was so comfortable. I could barely feel her weight on the back, and that was because the bike was so heavy that her weight made very little difference to how it handled. That adventure bike weighed more than 600 pounds and carried most of that weight high. Great on pavement, but as soon as I started to bounce the thing off-road, I realized my mistake. That bike is a handful on gravel and dirt. So I'm trading it in for a Yamaha Tenere 700, which weighs 450 pounds and has a parallel twin displacing 689cc. I'm willing to bet the difference off-road will be night and day. You see, Yamaha is one of the few motorcycle manufacturers that has bucked the trend and offered a smaller, simpler option to the consumer. The Tenere 700 has no traction control, no rider modes, no frills of any kind. It has ABS only because it's mandated to have it, but that ABS is not lean sensitive and can be turned off with one button. No fiddling with menus, there are none. That's why this is the least expensive and lightest middleweight adventure bike in the world right now. But is it successful? Can it make a dent in the adventure bike market? Well, when it came out at the end of 2019, it outsold the legend, the standard by which all others are judged, the market leader, the BMW R1250 GS. In Germany and in the UK too. These things are flying out of showrooms so quickly that they have just now started hitting North American shores and mine is not due in for another month, my dealer tells me. And Yamaha does have a Tenere 1200, but to their credit, they're not trying to get consumers to spend more by pushing the larger, more expensive product. They've given the consumers what they've been begging for all along, a lighter, simpler, less expensive, more capable off-road bike styled like a Dakar racer. They will sell every unit before it hits showrooms, and they will have the number one adventure bike in the world this year if they can only produce enough to keep up with demand. Amazing what happens when you listen to customers. Middleweight adventure bikes are the future. Maybe middleweight motorcycles are the future, period. Because Yamaha is not the first to follow this road to success. Way back in 2015, Ducati, that most premium of brands, released a couple of air-cooled scramblers that were reasonably priced and boosted the company's sales tremendously especially among young riders. Now the Scrambler line has grown to many different models and has become one of Ducati's highest selling bikes. Imagine if instead of the R18, BMW put out a 400 pound, 800 cc bike that looked like the actual R5 with disc brakes and fuel injection and cost what a Scrambler icon costs. You think they would sell a few? They might have had a best seller on their hands instead of a very expensive showpiece that will probably end up collecting dust in the garages of a few rich guys while those guys are out riding their GS's. And just this past year, Royal Enfield, a company that has very nearly been producing the same bike since the 1920s, came out with a pair of traditionally styled yet somewhat modern air-cooled 650cc twins. Those two models, the Interceptor and the Continental GT, are aimed squarely at the Triumph Bonneville line. 
They have less displacement, less performance, less technology than any of the Bonnevilles. But they also cost two-thirds as much as the cheapest Triumph. So do we have sales figures comparing how these two models are faring against the entire Bonneville range? I do have some 2020 sales numbers which are unfair to Royal Enfield because they only count the first three months of the Twins sales versus the first four months of Triumph's numbers. So did these two Royal Enfield models outsell all the Bonnevilles in that period? No. They outsold all Triumphs in that period. The Bonnevilles, the Tigers, the Rocket, the Street and Speed Triples, all of them. In the first three months of the year, Royal Enfield has sold over 20,200 Twins. In the first four months of the year, Triumph has sold 16,500 motorcycles. And yes, Triumphs are more expensive and there's more profit in selling one than in selling a Royal Enfield. But the important thing is the message that it delivers. Consumers want a no-frills motorcycle that's affordable. They want two wheels and an engine and they want it to look good and perform decently enough. If given the choice, they'll choose value over high tech and size and power. And yes, of course, some of them want the bells and whistles too. But when the bike that will make you feel the closest to being Marlon Brando only costs $8,000 Canadian, or whatever ridiculously low price it costs in your country, that's good enough for a lot of folks. That's an awfully low cost of entry for an authentic retro motorcycle. And by the by, Royal Enfield just opened their North American headquarters in Milwaukee. You think they're trying to deliver a message? So what do the Tenere 700, the Ducati Scramblers and the Royal Enfield Twins prove? That you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just have to offer two of them and a motor at a decent price and customers will stream in. And not just young customers either. I've received many comments from older riders who say that they have gone back down to middleweight bikes because they could no longer handle the big motorcycles they had. I hope the rest of the industry takes note, although I'm sure that Yamaha and Royal Enfield hope they don't. They want to continue to laugh all the way to the bank. So what smaller or middleweight motorcycle would you like to see? In previous videos I've already asked for an Indian FTR 750, an Africa Twin 800 and a full line of bikes around Harley's 975cc motor. What middleweight bike would get you into a showroom? Share your suggestions in the comments below. Who knows, if enough viewers ask for something, maybe the industry will take heed. Maybe the consumers should adopt some of those Pavlovian tactics and buy simpler stuff. That might train the manufacturers to produce more of it and deliver better value. Make them drool for a change. If you're interested in any of the gear that Brooke and I wear or use, or the camera equipment we use to film this channel, the links are below. Everything listed there was bought with our own money and we are not sponsored by any company. However, the links below are affiliate links and the channel is paid a small amount for referring you to shop at no additional cost to you. We do not recommend any products that we are not satisfied with ourselves, but we do strongly urge you to do your research and select the correct size for items like helmets and clothing. As always, thanks for watching, your support is greatly appreciated. Please hit that subscribe button, give the video a thumbs up, and leave a comment below. And whatever you ride, enjoy it. Wave at other bikers no matter what they're riding, we're all part of a brotherhood and sisterhood. Keep the rubber side down, shiny side up, and may the spokes be with you.